Hi, this is Scott Wilkinson, host of Home Theater Geeks. In episode 193, I chat with Sean Kelly and John Schurman of Panamorph about the company's new technology to encode more resolution and color onto Blu-rays and future 4K formats. So stay tuned. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for home theater geeks is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Home Theater Geeks with Scott Wilkinson, recorded February 6th, 2014, episode 193. Who wants more resolution and color? Hey there, Scott Wilkinson here, the Home Theater Geek and Director of Content at AVSForum.com. This week, we continue our discussion about anamorphic lenses and extend it way beyond where we went last week. Uh, joining me again is John Schuerman from Panamorph. Hey, John, welcome back. Thank you. Thanks for having me back. It was fun last week. Let's do, have some more fun today. I think we will. And uh, joining us for this show is Sean Kelly, the CEO and founder of Panamorph and developer of some new technology that we're going to get into today. Hey, Sean, welcome. Hi, Scott. Thanks. Uh, glad to be here. Yeah. Well, this technology is very interesting. So uh, let's get right to it. Before we do, though, I want to just quickly say those who are watching the stream live at live.twit.tv or logged into the chat room at irc.twit.tv can post questions uh, for both John and uh, Sean, and I will pass along as many as I can. So let's start by recapping quickly uh, the concepts uh, around anamorphic lenses and why they're important uh, before we get into these new technologies that will, will help, at, at least one of them will help uh, greatly uh, in the current age of high definition and in the future age of ultra high definition. Uh, John, why don't you uh, recap what we talked about last week as it pertains to what we're about to talk about here. Right. Yeah, I appreciate that. Uh, I'm just going to do this quickly because we did cover it last week. But just a quick review because it does tie directly to one of the two new technologies. One of the one of the two new technologies we'll be talking about is MFE multi-format encoding, which has directly to do with aspect ratios and anamorphic. So if I can, we go to page number one of that PDF I sent over. This is a quick aspect ratio explanation. I did this last week, but just very quickly. Just defining aspect ratios as the relationship of width to height. A, a image that has a 1.33 to 1 aspect ratio means the image is 1.33 times wider than it is tall. That's also known as 4 by 3, as you see right there. 16 by 9 is our current high definition ratio. Um, means 16 units wide by 9 units tall. In the film industry, we would call that 1.78 to 1, meaning simply that the image is 1.78 times wider wider than it is tall. And you can get that math very easily by dividing 16 by 9. 16 divided by 9 gets you 1.78. And then there's the 21 by 9 aspect ratio, which is what some of the TV manufacturers are calling what most people, the film fans, would call 235 to 1 or 2.40 to 1, which just means, again, the image is 2.40 times wider than it is tall or 2.35 times wider than it is tall. And the reason I'm, I'm getting into this is because one of the technologies, the one we're going to talk about first, has to do with getting movies or content that is shot in the 2.35 or 2.40 to 1 aspect ratio into a higher resolution container uh, to be displayed on properly equipped uh, displays. So we can go to the next page. Um, that should be, all right, this is how widescreen movies, those are ultra wide movies in 2.35 to 1 or 2.40 to 1 aspect ratio are displayed on 16 by 9 TVs and projectors and so forth. They're Which is mostly better. what we have today. I mean, most people have a 16 by 9 display, be it a flat panel or a projector. Exactly. And it's the vast majority of what's out there at CES, we all saw some 21 by 9 displays, which had that 2.35 to 1 aspect ratio. But if you're going to be showing movies that were shot in this higher, uh, wider aspect ratio of 2.40 to 1, you have to put black bars on top and bottom of the image, which is what we're all familiar with whenever we watch a widescreen film, an ultra wide film on a 16 by 9 monitor. 
But it also represents, not only those black bars represent a loss of screen space devoted to the picture, they also represent a loss of resolution. Uh, typically, a widescreen movie that shot 235 or 240 to 1 only has 810 uh, lines of resolution versus 1080. So it's 1920 by 810, sometimes 1920 by 817. So about 270 lines of resolution are wasted. They're devoted to drawing those black bars. And so that's what the first technology we're going to talk about is about getting that resolution back uh, and in a very ingenious way that Sean has developed. Um, and so bringing that back. So when we have just using projection as an example, when we're watching a 16 by 9 projector, when we're looking at a 240 to 1 film, 25 percent of the light output is blocked. 25 uh, percent of the resolution is gone. Um, devoted to black bars and people don't like them. And we talked about the immersive effect. We're not going to get into that so much today, but we're, we've developed or Sean has developed a system that helps bring back that loss resolution. And, and the key to that is anamorphic technology. And this is probably a little bit more difficult thing to understand. Again, we did cover it last week, but for anybody who didn't see that or give a brief refresher, if we can bring up uh, number three, the next page, and kind of explain what anamorphic is. Anamorphic is a system that was developed back in the 50s for film projection uh, for getting a high resolution image onto what it was essentially a square film frame. So if you look at the image on the left, it's your standard letterbox, which is 1920 by 810 resolution. Let's just say we're looking at HD content like Blu-ray. And on the right, we have an anamorphic image. And an anamorphic image is one that's squeezed uh, or stretch, depending on how you want to look at it, where the entire film frame or the entire display is used. So we're using all 1920 by 1080 resolution of our projector or display, but we end up with an image that's too tall and skinny. The advantage of anamorphic is that we're using the entire resolution of the imaging chip or the, dis the display panel. Uh, we're not wasting any resolution on black bars, but our geometry is incorrect. But this is how widescreen movies have been shot over the decades. Uh, an anamorphic lens was used to shoot the movie to expose the entire film frame using the entire height and width, uh, getting very high resolution, very high brightness. And then when the film was projected back, which goes to the next page, a opposing anamorphic lens was used in a different orientation that stretched the image back out. So it's a way for getting a, an ultra-wide image, a 2.40 to 1 or 235 to 1 image, onto a delivery medium that's not the same aspect ratio. So television, current HDTV and Blu-ray and other formats are 16 by 9. They're rectangular. They have a 1.78 to 1 aspect ratio. So 2.40 to 1 material has to be either low resolution because we're wasting 270 of those lines on black bars, or we can deliver it anamorphically by stretching the image vertically and storing the extra information onto the frame, uh, the video oh, frame. I, Go I want to say, I want to say that uh, in the chat room, some people are talking about the third option, <clears throat> pardon me, which is uh, in the case of some many uh, TV channels, when they broadcast a movie, they will crop the image to fill a 16 by nine frame, but you don't see what the director intended. Uh, it's chopped off some of the sides of the image. Well, that's exactly right. It, it's, it's hacked off. You literally have hacked off the side, the left and right side of the image. And I even noticed this when I was, was very young. I would notice watching movies on TV when they were always pan and scan onto a four by three display. You know, somebody talking and they're talking to somebody's nose or you don't see the other person they're talking to at all. And right. It's, Felt this weird disorientation in terms of the picture. So the way to solve that is to do the letterbox format, but it has its compromises. You lose the immersive effect. You lose some resolution. And that's where Sean developed this technology to kind of bring that resolution back. So I'm going to be talking about, you know, the visible representation of all of this and, and how kind of it works. And Sean obviously is the guy who originated all this and, and developed all this. So uh, he's going to chime in when I've left something out or something that we're you know, I'm maybe I'm, <laughs> I'm not the engineer. I'm not the guy who invented all this stuff. So, uh, well, we definitely want to get Sean. So we want to get Sean in here on that to talk about, uh, to talk about that. So, uh, have we finished uh, enough of a recap to to move into multi-format encoding? I think so. Unless Sean, unless you had anything else you think I kind of left out there. No, I think that I think that does it. Yeah. Okay. So okay. Very good. Can, yeah. 
the, sorry, the next. Oh, I'm sorry. The next slide is is kind of one that we developed when we were talking to some of the major studios, and this is kind of a a salesy kind of slide because it was pitching the concept to the the various uh, movie studios. And the idea here was, and this kind of goes directly to the question you were just asked in the chat room. It was, the idea here was one disc that could provide three different formats on it. So we were, this is just talking about Blu-ray. And just to be clear right up front, the technology we're talking about is not limited to Blu-ray in any way. Um, it's just, that was the the way we were initially talking about uh, bringing this technology to to the studios and to market, hopefully. So mm -hmm. the idea here was you would have one disc and with on, within that disc were encoded uh, three different versions of the film. And the first one being a standard 16 by nine letterbox, which would be what everybody's familiar with looking at. Again, it's 1920 by 810, uh, but it's the proper aspect ratio being shown on a 16 by shown on a 16 by nine display. So all the geometry is correct, but we have the black bars. So completely backwards compatible there. It looks like it would on any other display and the disc would have that version of the movie on there. And then the next version of the film that would be encoded onto that same disc was the 16 by nine full. And as you've noticed, I've lined through that because the feedback we got from the studios was at least one of them was that violates, you know, they, they see Blu-ray, you know, cause Blu-ray is what we initially were talking about here as the purest representation of the filmmaker's intent. And so if we're cropping the image, like say HBO does, HBO crops movies, that's a standard procedure there. Right. You're not maintaining the director's vision. You're losing the left and right sides of the image. So that format was kind of voted out, though it's still possible to do it. One of the things that we could do rather than having um, some people will hit zoom on their televisions and zoom in on the middle and crop off the sides, but it would still only at 810 line resolution image in the center, but we could deliver a true 1080. But that one's been cut, uh, cut out of our proposal. But so the, the real benefit here is that we have a process that allows for the letterbox version of the movie for anybody who has a standard 16 by nine display or projector and a standard Blu-ray player. It would look just like it does on any other uh, Blu-ray release of the film, but encoded within this process is a higher resolution version of the 240 to one film. And I'm going to use 240 to one as the standard. Most films since 72 were are actually shot 240 to one. I'm going to use that as the fallback rather than 235, even though it's a very common usage to say right. 235. Most films are actually 240. So the, and just to make sure everybody understand, just to make sure everybody understands, that's 2.40 to 1 aspect ratio. Uh, we, right. we often don't say the point. I mean, you know, <laughs> everybody likes to save that extra millisecond, so uh, they don't say the point often. Yeah, and I talk uh, fast anyway, so it's <laughs> two point, you're correct, and it's important because it's 2.40, again, means the image 2.4 times wider than it is tall. Right. So rather than having... You know, normally that would be 1920 by 810. And this is where Sean's technology comes in. And if we go to the um, the next slide, here's kind of where we start. The film is shot in this 240 to 1 aspect ratio. And if it exists as a 4K master, it will exist as a 4096 by 1728 resolution widescreen master. Now, or, that, was not, that was not shot with uh, anamorphic lens, it looks like to me, correct? This would be, let's say, something that was shot with a red camera or one of the other 4K digital capture cameras right, right. now. But so, not with not with an anamorphic lens that squeezes the image and uses the entire imaging sensor in the camera, correct? Exactly. And one of the things we're starting to see is even cinematographers using the red camera and other digital cameras are starting to use anamorphic lenses with even that sensor. Uh, the, the, the remake of Total Recall that came out last year was shot with an anamorphic, I believe an anamorphic red. So they actually exposed, for lack of a better term, the entire chip uh, mm -hmm. so, you know, with an anamorphic image like you see on the right of this slide, which is, again, you're using the entire imaging chip or the entire film of uh, frame of film using that for full resolution. Uh, and one of the things I found out with all the research was went out to Hollywood and talked to one of the post houses and they walked me through the, their transfer 
stuff and all that. And if a film is shot anamorphically where we have that, uh, you know, that extra resolution vertically, it's archived that way. So extra vertical resolution is available in the film elements or the digital elements that we could easily extract additional vertical resolution out of to put it onto this disc so we would have the extra resolution. Okay. Um, so I, I want to get Sean in here. Sean, can you tell us a bit more about uh, the MFE, multi-format encoding technology, how you came up with it, um, maybe some more technical detail about it, not without giving away trade secrets, of course, but... Um, you know, I, I think we're all geeks on this bus, so I, I'd love to, to get as much uh, technical background on it as I can. Sure. Uh, all the multi-format encoding technology is based on what we call transforms. Uh, certainly, we can go from one format or one resolution to another based on scaling. And there are scaling artifacts that could happen uh, depending on the scaling technology, et cetera. And exactly. That, in, that always bothers me when I hear the word scaling. I kind of go, uh-oh. In fact, um, we wanted to make sure we contrasted MFE against scaling for Hollywood because they had the exact same reaction. Mm -hmm. What MFE is based on is, uh, is specific transform relationships in terms of ratios from one resolution to another. So, for example, anamorphic uh, in general in terms of uh, video is 1.33 times the height of the letterbox movie. So that's a magic ratio. It's really four to three, four thirds. Mm -hmm. And that ratio exists in a number of cases, even if we go all the way up to uh, some of the newer uh, red cameras are 5120 by 2160, which is the 240-237.1 aspect ratio. Uh, if we want to convert 5120 to 3840 or UHD, that's another one of these magic ratios, which is three to four. So what MFD huh. is based on is these magic ratios, either four to three, three to four. And it is. A and is there any, wait, 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 hang on, hang on one second. Is there any relationship between that and the fact that the original standard definition uh, television aspect ratio was also four to three? No. <laughs> um, I started with that. So the fact that we, I, I mean, that aspect ratio four to three, in fact, the original Panamorph lenses were created to convert four by three projectors to 16 by nine, because that is a multiple of four to three. So 21, ah. nine or two four O projectors um, with anamorphic lenses. So 16, nine, projectors with the anamorphic lens it's the same ratio so so that's why that's why they chose is that one reason they chose 16 by 16 by 9 to re, to for high definition to replace 4 by 3 because it is kind of the same ratio i don't know that for a fact uh what i do know is that they knew movies were either 240 or 185 predominantly mm -hmm. so they picked hdtv as 1.77 uh 1.78 to be a middle ground, to somewhat be able to show all content at the time. Mm, yeah, if okay. I could, if I, if but I it's could not just necessarily jump. because that there's this magic ratio between them. Uh, there are a number of these magic ratios, as I call them. Three to four is a key one because it converts from from you know non anamorphic to anamorphic with with the standard anamorphic lenses. There's another key ratio, which would be four to five. If you take four fifths of a 5120 wide image, you get 4096. So, which, which is cinema 4K, the, the horizontal resolution of, of 4K when you go to the commercial cinema. It's not what you get with UHD, which is also called 4K, and therein lies a bunch of confusion. But I just wanted to make sure people understood that uh, 4096 is the horizontal resolution you go, you see in a commercial cinema when you go to a movie house that's using 4K. Exactly. So what we want to do is have a number of these magic ratios. Hopefully they work. Um, the, the four to three ratio seems to be a very natural ratio for uh, these transforms that were created. They're very simple transforms. In fact, 
they're so simple that they can be expressed in, in binary operations. So they're very, very fast. Uh, there's no floating point operations, you know, getting into the full geekiness here. Mm-hmm. Uh, the, uh, and the magic of the transforms is that they're reversible. So when we, for example, as John said, we start with an anamorphic image. So all the, all the vertical resolution is there, but we need this to be backward compatible. So we want to show a letterbox image as well. So really for every four vertical pixels in that image, we want to convert that to three vertical pixels plus one extra pixel of what we call extra data. So those three pixels that we converted from four, three to four, now represent an, Im- an image that is three-fourths the height. So that's which, how we which totally to represents then the the proper aspect ratio with black letterbox bars on a sixteen by nine display. Exactly. So if we want to be able to reverse that operation, we take the extra pixel, the extra data, if you will, and we simply apply the equations in reverse, if you will, and we get back the original four pixels. So hmm. that's where the transform comes from. And what we do with MFE, and then John's gonna, and John has some more slides about this, is, well, where is that extra data? And we, in fact, hide that extra data in the black bars. So whereas in a backward-compatible letterbox image, you would see these black bars, the Blu-ray can actually have scripting in it to turn on black bars. In our process... If you want to decode this to the full vertical resolution, the full 1080p of the anamorphic version, you turn off the black bars, which reveals the extra data. Um, actually, if I can hand it back to John so he can go through those, because he's got a number of slides that tries to illustrate that. Perfect. Right. So if we can bring up the uh, the next page on there. Okay, there's our – that's the Hollywood master, Okay. That's what we're starting out with. Then we're going to create a submaster, and that's the next page. All right, so now from those high-resolution elements from the studio, we create an anamorphic master, a submaster that has the extra vertical resolution in there. This is now, if we're doing uh, HD, we're at 1920 by 1080, right, rather than 1920 by 810, or right. if we're in... Uh, uh, at UHD would be a 3840 by 2160, but we have all picture information. We don't have black bars here. So we create, just like what Sean was describing, by taking out that fourth pixel and reducing it to three, we create a letterboxed version of the film, which should be in the next, the next page. And so this is what we end up with if we do not have the black bars layered over. And you can kind of see it depending on the quality of your connection here. There's what looks like noise in those gray bars, that's where that extra pixel data is stored. So that's... So we're, yeah, zooming, we're of, zooming right into that to those gray bars, which would normally display as black on a 16 right. by 9 screen. But here we see a bunch of extra data. Yeah, extra resolution data. And so if somebody puts this Blu-ray in a regular Blu-ray player, and again, this doesn't have to, this isn't exclusive to Blu-ray, but I'm going to, since everybody's familiar with Blu-ray, we, you know, just limit the discussion to that uh, for this discussion, this part right. of the discussion. Sure. We're going to have a black Java graphic, and this is talking with some of the people we consulted with, uh, that just overlays on top of that gray, those gray bars. So when you play it back in a regular Blu-ray Blu-ray player, it just looks like a, like a regular letterbox version of the film. And it looks no better, no worse than your standard 1920 by 810 letterboxed. However, if your display has the decode or the Blu-ray player has a decode, it reintegrates that information. And it then you're right back to the anamorphic image you start out with. You can go back one page. You, when you reintegrate the information, you end up back with that anamorphic image. So now it's up to the display to know what to do with that, uh, right. assuming that you have the decode. So Brent, that just goes to the next slide I have. Before we, but wait, before we get there, I, and that's going to be an interesting uh, slide, I'm sure. I, in fact, I see that it is. Um, but I have a couple questions. One in the chat room uh, from Da Vinci Wonder, and Sean, you might be able to answer this. Is this uh, restoring or re, re, reconstituting the, the data 
similar to how RAID arrays, hard disk arrays, rebuild their data when one hard, dri hard drive goes bad? Uh, I don't know enough about RAID to be able to answer that. Um, I can say that what the extra data is is really uh, difference functions. And a lot of video technology, we use differencing um, as, a, as a way to encode the information. So this is not redundancy. It is actual uh, real pixel values yeah. in this case. So um, it is actual extra data that is required. Um, it really represents true additional information, not redundancy. Gotcha, gotcha. The other question I had for you is uh, how, much, uh, how much extra data is re would, would this, would a, a file encoded in MFE uh, require on or take up on the disk? Would it be 33% more data? It actually is not because of the differencing approach. Um, as you saw in that slide, that was an actual slide of the extra data for that image. Um, it's fairly uniform. And because the, the extra data doesn't actually represent a lot of change throughout that image, the compression algorithms don't have to work as hard to give you the, the precision of those values at the same time. So you might have a, uh, an overhead of 15 to 20%, but certainly not up to the 33%. Oh, okay, cool. Um, all right, John, you were about to show us the next slide and uh, what the different, I think that's gonna be what the different, uh, if you have different types of displays, what can you expect from, from a file encoded in this way? Right, so uh, you know, as I mentioned, you end up back with a letter, or excuse me, an anamorphic image. Now, as Sean was just saying, that anamorphic image represents a true increase of resolution of 33% in the vertical. So it's real picture detail that's there. So how are we going to then, how is the display going to interpret this anamorphic image? Well, if you're just working with a standard HD, again, using Blu-ray as the example, you're using a standard HD TV at 16 by 9, and you have a standard Blu-ray player, it's just going to do 1920 by 810 like you see in the upper left, right? Using a current Blu-ray player and a current 16 by 9 HD TV, it's no better, it's no worse than what everybody's looking at now. There's no totally, benefit. Right. Go totally ahead. backwards compatible, though. Right. It just pop it into plays. Uh, we've done this on laptops and everything else. It just plays. However, if you have, this is where it kind of ties into the panamorph and talking to what we were talking about last week, the ultimate implementation of this is, is the upper right-hand slide is with an anamorphic lens that's able to, with an anamorphic projection system, you just expand that out optically. So we get that additional 33% resolution. We're at 1920 by 1080. And then we horizontally expand it using the lens or vertically compressing it, depending on the type of lens we're talking about. So now we have, instead of 810 that scaled to 1080 and then expanded using an anamorphic lens, we started out with true 1920 by 1080, full resolution, no scaling, just the lens expanding it out. The same thing would be true for a 21 by 9 HD TV, like Vizio showed last a year or two ago. Couple and now we're seeing ago. 21. Yeah, 21 by 9 TVs out right now. We're seeing a Samsung, LG, and Toshiba. We're showing them at CES. Well, they're it not out right it, now, but they're they're the ultra HD versions of 21 by 9. Right, and we don't know when and if those will ship. Those are prototypes. That's right. true. But a 21 by 9 display. In fact, I. I kind of want to take that back. I do know LG for sure is shipping the 21 by 9 flat version. They just may not be doing the curved version. And technically it's commercial. But anyway, a 21 by 9 formatted display like, like we saw at CES could take advantage of that same vertical resolution. Then it is a scaling operation, but only in the horizontal. It would just scale. Instead of starting out from 1920 by 810 and going up to 5120 by 2160, it would actually start out with 1920 by 1080, uh, so it had more. It, it had additional resolution to start out with to create that 21 by 9 image. Always so, a good idea to start with more more resolution, more data than less. <laughs> yeah, the more you have going in, the better results you're going to have, and and there's yeah. less scaling involved because it's you, since you have 1080 vertical, you're just going to 2160. You're just doubling in the vertical. That's very simple to do, and then it's just a horizontal function that's transferred back out to the sides. Right. So. Going to the third application, um, 
you would have, let's say you have a UHD, a 4K TV, and you're using, again, standard, or I don't want to say standard definition, standard Blu-ray at high definition at 1920 by 1080. Even if you have a 16 by 9 UHD display, if you had a, a Blu-ray that was encoded with this, you could build a letterboxed image that started out with 1080 vertical lines of resolution instead of 810. So again, even if you're watching it letterboxed in a 4K 16 by 9, you're starting out with 33% more resolution in the vertical. That was a little bit harder to wrap your mind around, but you know, hopefully that makes sense. You're trying to but make once, a letterboxed once, image. Go ahead. Right. Once again, it's it's you're starting with more data to begin with, which is going to give you a better result. Exactly. You're, you're starting right. out and with 19... 1080 just, in the just to interject there, uh, if anybody's interested in, okay, how exactly are you doing that? You're not really going from 1080 to 1620 for the letterbox because, again, you know, those can be some odd ratios. But what you right. do is, I mean, everybody is talking about UHD, the, the quality of upconverting from 1080 to, to 2160. And, right. and and how great that is. And we don't want to uh, interfere with that at all. So what we do is we say, okay, take the anamorphic 1080, upconvert that to 2160, then use one of these magic ratios. Again, in this case, it'd be three fourths to convert it back down to 1620. Mm. So we get the best of all worlds. You're starting with that full anamorphic resolution, but then you're getting the benefit of all the latest upconversion technology at the same time. Well, we have to say also, though, that uh, the the, up, the quality of the upconversion in UHD TVs is one of the primary bugaboos of the of the new format of UHD because there isn't a lot of content, so mostly what people are going to be watching is upconverted HD, and some TVs do it better than others. So it is of concern. Um, for example, the Seiki uh, UHD TVs. When fed native 4K content can look pretty good, but when fed uh, HD content, uh, well, the quality of their upscaler just simply isn't, you know, up to snuff. So, uh, so the reviewers say. Uh, so, uh, you know, that is a, a a concern that we have to be careful of when when talking about upconversion. That it's not always going to be great. Absolutely true. Technically, the options are there. It's a business decision whether the manufacturers offer that to the, their markets, of course. Right, exactly. So, so we're saying we have 33% additional resolution there to start out with to right. give them more real, resolu real resolution for them to upconvert from. And like Sean says, using those ratios that he was describing, it's there. Um, it's it's just pretty pretty straightforward in terms of being able to get to that letterbox version on a 16 by 9. Because one of the things you cannot do, because I get asked this question, well, why can't I get the full 1080 resolution and still have the letterbox? Well, you can't because you're on a fixed pixel display. Uh, if we're talking about a 1920 by 1080, but you can on a 4K starting out with 1080 get up to uh, your 3840 by 1620 with the, a real benefit of additional 33% of resolution. Mm -hmm. So, and then just following the, fi finishing this out, because we get to talk about the deep color stuff, which is, which is really cool too. Um, mm -hmm. The, if you had a UHD format, whatever that is going to be, our process is completely compatible with UHD. So it would be the exact same uh process all the way down the line. You'd start out with a high resolution master. You would then, uh, encode the additional resolution um, at 3840 uh, by 1620 would be the letterbox version. We would just hide the additional from 1620 to 2160 behind the black bar. So it would be the same thing. It's completely adaptable to UHD. The same exact process will work. Mm -hmm. And it's just if you're watching on a 4K 16 by 9 TV and you have 4K source content, you're going to be looking at 3840 by 1620 letterbox. The extra data will be hidden back behind there for re reconstruction if we want to do a 21 by 9 5k display or a 4k projector anamorphic you can do that right right uh, sentinel in the chat room is asking does that does this mean that if i have a uhd projector i wouldn't need an anamorphic lens to get a 21 by 9 image at 1080 that's kind of a good question uh, an anamorphic image at 1080 it would still be if he had a Okay, if they have a 4K projector and, and they happen to have a Blu-ray that has uh, our system on it, 
they would have an anamorphic image. Still, the projector would need to upscale that to 4K. They'll, you still need the anamorphic lens then to to restore the geometry. So right, that's, right. That's what I that's what I'm thinking as well. Um, <clears throat> one other question before we move on um, to either of you. Uh, let me start with Sean. I remember the days of anamorphic DVDs, right, where they did exactly what you're talking about here at standard definition. The, the letterbox movie would be stored on the disc in an anamorphic way, and the DVD player would actually uh, unsqueeze it, if you will, and provide yeah. the letterbox bars and so on. Um, so this feels like uh, almost a return to that technology, only at higher definition. Uh, is that a fair assessment or not? Uh, somewhat. Interestingly, that is where a lot of the anamorphic lens business for consumer video started uh, is because so many people had uh, four by three projectors with uh, the enhanced for 16.9 or um, anamorphic DVDs. So you could play these DVDs on your Blu-ray player and tell it basically that you had a 4.3 projector so it would, uh, it would show the entire anamorphic image. So people needed an anamorphic lens to reformat, optically reformat it into 16 by 9. So a lot of that concept is within the, the MFE as well. We could have, uh, as an industry, put out all our Blu-rays in anamorphic and had the Blu-ray player select three out of four lines of resolution and only present those. And in fact, that's pretty much what the DVD players were doing back in the day when they needed to show Letterbox. So they oh, were taking yeah. three out of four lines and showing it. Now, sampling-wise, that's really nasty. Um, <laughs> back in those days with very limited resolution on the DVD and the, and the displays themselves, you didn't really notice it so much. But these days, we have a higher standard. And taking, simply taking three lines out of four is just losing a line. Every fourth line is not a very good sampling architecture. But the same kind of concept does somewhat exist. We could have, we could have all our Blu-ray movies been produced anamorphically, and then the, the Blu-ray players could have sampled that so people could see Letterbox. The, the trick was there wasn't this new display, this 21.9 display to support that. So there was no need in the marketplace for anamorphic. And even at this point, when we go to the studios and we talk about this extra content, especially in the Blu-ray days before UHD, a lot of the comment was, well, if you've got 10,000 anamorphic lens customers, that's not a big enough market for us to put out an anamorphic Blu-ray. Mm. And that is exactly the reason we needed to come up with something that would provide both these modes, both the letterbox and the anamorphic on one disc. Right. But isn't your, you, you mentioned, uh, you know, that the throwing one line out of four away is not a good sampling technique, but isn't that exactly what you're doing here? No. In fact, the, the transform to go from four pixels to three does not just throw away the one pixel. It trans, uh. it, 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 and it's not really scaling, but it is as good as the best scaling you can get. This representation of three pixels out of four. So no, mm. we don't just throw one away. Okay. There are actually equations between all the pixels in this case. And uh, just to speak to that real quick, we are we have a demo disc that that we've circulated with the studios, and it's got copyright material on it. But it, it's we have a split screen that has right down the middle. Um, Standard letterbox using standard scaling process and derived from MFE, and you can't tell the difference side to side, which, mm. which which is done. So we want to make sure the process does not degrade the image at all for somebody who's just watching it letterbox, because that's going to be the majority of customers. You know, is going to be watching it letterbox just to have a 16 by 9 display, um, and so it, it's it's transparent, it, it's clean, it's. Uh, right. And the other thing we heard from the studios, and I also heard this on the digital cinema side, is. Multiple inventory is is a scary term to Blu-ray manufacturers <laughs> and also digital cinema. They don't want to have a separate 3D version of something, an anamorphic version of something, a letterbox version of something. And that's, again, right. what we thought was the beauty of this is one disc. They're both on there, single inventory. So. Right. 
Right. Okay, let's uh, let's turn our attention to deep color encoding or DCE, which is the other technology we want to talk about today. Uh, give us the background on that. Okay, well, this is, uh, if we can bring up, this one's kind of a boring slide because it's just kind of bullet points, but just kind of runs down what deep color encoding is about. I mean, we're all, everybody's talking about UHD and there's all this discussion about what is UHD going to mean. And one of the things that we found talking again to the studios is they're all taking this uh, position that resolution isn't enough. Just the difference between 2K and 4K resolution doesn't give a dramatic enough difference in picture quality. So what is UHD going to be? And so the, most of the talk now is in we need deeper, richer colors. We need greater dynamic range. Uh, Dolby's heavy also in making higher brightness displays, which is also part of higher dynamic range. But to do that, you know, what we're talking about doing is going to a wider color gamut so more colors are represented. To do that, we need greater bit depth per color to be able to draw those colors accurately without banding artifacts and so on that will be will be showing here momentarily. So what deep color encoding does is again, Sean, you know, using some of the lessons from MFE and some of the thought processes there is hiding this extra deep color information inside the image. So what deep color encoding does is it delivers 12 bit equivalent color depth via Blu-ray and it doesn't again doesn't have to be Blu-ray, just Blu-ray is the best delivery format we have right now. Okay? So next generation UHD can certainly take advantage of this. Um, so do to support the higher dynamic range displays, deep color. Uh, also, we know that we're moving to higher color gamuts, and we'll be talking a little bit about 2020. 709 is the cu current HDTV color gamut, and 2020, what that means, I have a slide on that. Uh, and there's also an intermediate one we'll probably talk about. And so, again, maintaining backwards compatibility using the same uh, philosophies behind MFE to make sure this would play back in a standard 8-bit player, 8-bit uh, display, and you know, to have that full backwards compatibility. And yeah, the idea I want to make sure I want to make sure everybody understands that our current video system, high definition with Blu-ray, with broadcasting, anything that you get in high definition um, uses eight bits per color. And there are three colors, red, green and blue. And uh, so eight bits are used to represent the uh, brightness of that color from zero to 255. Um, and so if you expand the color range out, <clears throat> you need to use more bits or else you get into this problem of banding, which is what we're going to talk about next. Right. We'll see the, if we can bring up the next slide. Uh, I believe that's okay. So this is just to kind of define high dynamic range and, and I'm sure people here have been probably reading up on, on Dolby vision and all that. They're talking about high dynamic range and we can't even show this because we don't have any displays that show 12-bit or 10-bit color right now. Uh, so Actually, looking there, at there this. are some. There are some. Uh, the Vizio right. Reference Series is 10-bit. Most of the sharp panels are 10-bit, I, I learned at CES. Um, yeah. And the, and the high-end Toshibas are as well. So there are a few 10-bit displays out there. I don't think there are any 12-bit. Yeah, Panasonic was showing at CES an 11-bit display that was that was pretty impressive. That was showing the P3 color gamut. Sean and I took a look at that, and that was very impressive. I, I think the point I was trying to make is that anybody who's watching this at home, the best they're going to see is 8-bit. So we have to simulate 12-bit using 8-bit because um, we don't have any way to really show the the 12-bit a 12-bit image because right. nobody's got a, a monitor that they can look at it with. So that's where we're going to explain some of the slides. So we can go back to the slide here real quick. You know, this is what, what companies uh, are doing to kind of simulate the difference between high dynamic range versus what we're looking at now. And it's, it's basically kind of like a hyper contrast is the way I kind of describe it, uh, to talk about the greater differences between black and all the shades from black to white. You need all the colors to make those up. And having the greater color bit depth is where you get all those additional steps in order to get all those different shades of color from the very darkest to the very lightest. And so going to the next slide, here's we're talking about color gamuts and and the larger the outside of this, you know, the entire range that we see here is what we can see with our human eye. It's a fair that's representation. That, yeah, that's the outer curved line, the outer curved boundary of this colored sort of horseshoe looking thing. Right. The outer that's, boundary, the very outside. That's what, is we, what can we can see. see. That's what we can see by with our eyes. And the two right. triangles inside are what 
uh, are two different sets of red, green, and blue and the uh, range of colors that they can reproduce. Right. So the yellow triangle on the inside is what we're seeing right now, what, what is called Rec 709. It's HDTV. We can see that's probably less than half of what's actually visible to the human eye. Um, so especially look at the green, how much green we're not actually seeing uh, that's cut off, that's not actually being displayed. And of course, this is also scaled down 8 bits, so we're not even really seeing what's there. But this is kind of a representation of it. And one of the uh, formats that's being floated out there is this Rec 2020, which is the black triangle. And that is going to give us a heck of a lot more uh, realistic, true-to-life color, a lot more of what we can see. It still doesn't get all of it, but it, it, it represents a heck of a lot more of what the human eye is capable of perceiving. And in between those two, and it's not on this chart, is what's called P3 or DCI Digital Cinema, which is a 10 or 12-bit process that gets us about halfway in between 709 and 2020. And that's what Panasonic was showing at CES, was one that we could reproduce the P3 or DCI color space, which is in between 709 and 2020. And that was substantial difference. Sean and I took a look at those two monitors side by side, and it was clear that the DCI standard uh, delivered quite a bit more in, in different shades and richness of color than 709 does. Right. In so fact, this is, I think I think it's important to point out that while everybody is focused on the resolution of Ultra HD, um, you can't really see much of a difference between HD and UHD on a sort of quote-unquote normal size screen at a quote-unquote normal seating distance. But you can see tremendous difference if you expand the color gamut as we're talking about. Right, and you've probably heard that Simti's done these studies and there was somebody talking about that at CES. What do people perceive, first of all? It's not resolution, it's color, it's brightness, it's contrast. And going to higher dynamic range means wider color, means greater contrast. And Dolby's also addressing the, the brightness side of the equation with their Dolby vision. So those are the things that people see first before they see resolution. So yep. resolution is important, but it's not as important as color. But the thing is, as you expand, if we go from 709 to 2020, we now have a greater range of color we have to reproduce. And if we don't have the bit depth, we're going to have this banding artifact that you mentioned. And I think that's the next slide if we go to the next, next page here. Um, uh, there it is. Yeah. All right, and again, depending on the quality of the stream people are looking at and the quality of their monitors, this is what banding looks like. This is actually a 4-bit image. We had to go to 4 bits to show you what it looks like on an 8-bit monitor. What so serious look banding around, looks like. Yeah, this is what we would see if we, only, if we stuck with 8-bit and tried to go to Rec 2020 or the DCI color space. We would see these kind of artifacts, and I've even noticed them even on poorly authored uh, Blu-rays today, uh, uh, for some reason, the New Line logo, whenever it comes up on a Blu-ray, it's got banding like mad on it, um, and that it shouldn't really be. And so you can see that, and that's the kind of artifact you would have. So we need all the additional color steps, all the different gradations of color, so we don't have that banding artifact. Sean, did you want to contribute in? I don't know if I left anything out here because this is more your area of expertise. Nope, that, that's all good. I mean, there's a number of, you know, side comments, but we'll miss the whole story if we, uh, if we sidetrack. So keep going. If we get too sidetracked. All right. Okay, good. So if we go to the, the next slide is essentially what the engineer just did. It's just a close-up of the banding artifact, so we don't really need to spend any time in this. But hopefully everybody can see it's just, it's just nasty. So It's nasty. Yeah, it's – so, again, through the quality of the streaming and everything else, I don't know how well all this is going to be communicated, so – I'm going to walk through it, and we'll, we'll hopefully people can see this as they're viewing it. But what yep. we're going to start with, we're going to start with an 8-bit image right now that's simulating a 12-bit image because we don't really have any way to do this with 12 bits because nobody's going to be looking at this on a 12-bit display. So we start out with an 8-bit image. Um, again, extrapolating out, this would be a 12-bit image. And then here's what we did to prove the concept of, of Sean's technology. We took that down to 4 bits. Okay, Go to the next image. And hopefully, you, again, you can see this again. The streaming is going to, you know, degrade the image so much. But on the left is our 8-bit original, and on the right is a 4-bit intermediary. What we're simulating here is starting out with 12-bit and then going down to 8. We're right. simulating so it by the, going from 8 to 4. Right. 
Yeah. So you Thank can see you a ton too. more banding in the 4-bit image than you can in the 8-bit image. Yes, exactly. So that's thank you for doing that close up. That really helps illustrate that. So what we do is we start out with the 12 bit image. We take it down to eight bits, again represented by eight to four, and then we go to the next one, next page. We're going to there's our four bit intermediary, uh, and then the, we we put the information back together using Sean's algorithms, and we go from that four bit. That's the four bit image. And we reconstruct back out to eight bit while using information that was stored in the four bit in in image. Ah, okay. So you took an, uh, just as a me means of demonstration, you took an eight bit image and reduced it down to four bits, but in, but kept the, the extra bits in the image in a, in a way similar to what we were talking about with MFE that it's hidden in the image itself and can be restored, uh, reconstituted. It, it precisely. It's it's not quite the same process as MFE, and obviously Sean's going right. to speak to to what what he's doing to a certain degree because that's the secret sauce, right? So right. we have the four bit, you know, the eight bit image. We we can decimate it down to four bits, but still keep the information we need to bring it back to eight bits within that four bit image. And if we go to the next slide here, um, is uh, proof is in the pudding, and again. You know, got to apologize here for we're streaming this, so it's not going to be great. But on the left is the original 8-bit image, and this is an actual screenshot, and it's not high resolution or anything here because of the streaming. And on the right is the image that was started out as 8, went to 4, and then restored back to 8. So there's the original that we're seeing right now, and here is the restored image, which went, had gone down to 4 and then back up to 8. And yeah, and, and there you can sort of see side by side. There still is a little banding in the original eight. Um, yeah, that's in the original eight, like you said. So, yeah, but not too bad. And and the restored version has no more banding, certainly than than the original. So you have been successful in reducing the bit depth and then reconstituting or restoring the original after that reduction. Sean, uh, we don't have a lot of time left, so. Uh, if you can, give us a, a quick overview of, of how you're doing this. It seems pretty remarkable to me. Uh, sure. I mean, a lot of it is uh, anything with imaging these days is, you know, if it looks good, then it's good. I mean, even when we sample color spaces, uh, we can only see so many uh, differences in, in a color space. We don't need a continuous representation of all the colors that it, that represents reality. So we know that we can sample real life and still get something that looks very real. So the bottom line there is that there is redundancy in information. So this process, the DCE process, does not in fact give you the original 12-bit per color, per pixel information. What it does do is analyze the image and basically through its algorithms decide what information is important to represent a full 12-bit image without the banding. So in so doing, it, that decision process it determines what that information should be and that information is stored in what we call the least significant bit of each pixel value. So if you actually looked in, this, in the encoded 4-bit image in this example, you would see a very fine dithering structure, if you will. And it does serve as dithering. It takes away a lot of the banding. But the reason for it is the dithering actually encodes the extra information. So if you have the decode algorithm, then you can restore, you take away this dithering look, and you can restore the information mm. that's, again, required to make it appear to look like 12 bits. And so if you even on an eight, analyze, Even on an 8-bit display. In this case, if you analyze uh, the original 8-bit image and then the reconstructed 8-bit image after the process... Mm -hmm. you will see that the pixel values are not the same. However, they appear to be the same. 
So once again, we're exploiting the fact that the human visual system does very well in some cases, and in other cases, that information is redundant. If it's redundant, we don't need to include it. So this process, even though we're encoding the equivalent of 12 bits into 8, again, the overhead is only about 15% more than if you had um, the original 12-bit image. And that's mm. really the key process here, whether it's Blu-ray at HD or UHD or even 8K, we're trying to, there are so many different things that we want to put in this content. Uh, frame rates, resolution, color, all sorts of things. And yeah. we only have so much bandwidth to include. So what we're doing with this process is trying to reserve as much bandwidth for everything else as possible. Now, the other question I have for you is, at CES, we saw, and we've seen for a couple of years, uh, some companies touting that they have a wider color gamut than 709. Uh, Sony uh, Triluminous is a wider color gamut. Uh, Panasonic was talking about, uh, I think it's called Studio Master or something like that. Um, so can this benefit, can, can this technology utilize those wider color gamuts? I'm concerned about the fact that those wider color gamuts are not well-defined. In other words... Sony is using one. Panasonic might be using a different one. Uh, you know, there's no standard that everyone has agreed upon for a wider color gamut. Rec 2020, we assume, will be agreed upon at some time in the future, but it hasn't been yet. So will this benefit those TVs that have, you know, a proprietary wider color gamut? Yes, it will. Uh, in effect, the DCE process is independent of the color gamut itself. So if you, I mean, one way or another, you have deep color content and you have deep color displays. If you have a deep color display without the content, then what are you showing? So you're absolutely right. We have to standardize on something to, to make it work for everybody. In this particular case, and I just want to be clear, if we encode a 2020 movie, uh, so all the colors in, in the recommendation that the ITU BT 2020 into the content, then that content is made for a display that can show that content. So we have to decode it towards that. If right. we encode in 2020 and show this on a Rec 709 standard display, the colors will be off. We are working on uh, ways to try to transform from 2020 to 709, but there might be some some things lost in the sauce, if you will. So <laughs> that's still part of the conversation. What is best? What should we do versus necessarily what can we do? Do we put out Blu-rays with 2020 and then, and then have a, another Blu-ray in the same box that has a 709, or do we have both color spaces? So it could be that 709, there's 2020, there's DCI, there's Adobe, you know, RGB. Um, there's all sorts of different ones. Right. Uh, that's something for the industry to conclude on its conversation and make some real implementations. Which I hope they do. Um, so just to be clear, what you're, what this DCE would give you is uh, – in an, on an 8-bit Blu-ray, on an 8-bit display, the equivalent of 12 bits of color depth um, in, this, in this sort of dithering format. Have I got that right? It would be 12 bits of color depth, but it would represent the, the color gamut or color space that you encoded to start with. So if you showed, if the Blu-ray, for example, was encoded with a movie that represents the 2020 color space, mm -hmm. you would not want to show that on a Rec. 709, a standard 8-bit display. As you said before, you right. Not, right. You would not be able to see those colors. Right. But, but, with, uh, but if you had a Rec. 2020 or a, D, or a DCI P3 display, you could, in fact, uh, show the colors correctly uh, if it was encoded in this way. Absolutely. As long as yeah. the decode is in either the Blu-ray player or the display itself. 
Fantastic. Well, listen, we've run out of time. I want to thank you both very much for being here. It's uh, been a super geeky hour, and I really appreciate it. Uh, John Shurman and Sean Kelly, both of Panamorph. Thanks so much for being here. Thank, thank you for having us. You bet. Uh, you get more information about this at Panamorph.com. You can find me, of course, online at avsforum.com. You can email me at scott at twit.tv. And you can follow me on Twitter at HTGeekScott and also at AVS Forum. Next week, my guest geek is scheduled to be uh, Walter Rullen. Uh, I hope I get his name pronounced correctly. He's the main architect of Ultra D, a glasses-free 3D system from a company called Stream TV Networks. And believe me, it actually works. So we're going to learn all about that next week. And I do hope you will join me for that. Until then, geek out.